All right, and welcome everybody. Today is uh, day 23 of Maker Camp. I'm Nick Raymond, and uh, we have an awesome hangout planned today. Uh, today is Weird Science Wednesday, and as always, if you have questions during this hangout, feel free to leave them under in the comment section of this post. Uh, so before we get into the project for today, I'll introduce everyone who's in the hangout. So starting at the very end, we've got uh, Jonah. How's it going, Jonah? Uh, you are the winner of the Google Science Fair for ages uh, 13 to 14, is that right? Yeah. Very cool. So we'll hear back from you in a, a little bit about uh, your experience with that. We also have joining us in the Make Labs, uh, Josie, Yuli, and Brian Milani. How's it going, guys? Hey. hey. And then we also have joining us today uh, Anne Marie, Matt, Hi. and uh, the founder Hi. of the, the cool place that you're in. Is that the, the mill? We're at the mill. Yeah. We'll take you on a tour in a little bit. OK, very cool. So uh, today, uh, I'll kick it off to Anne Marie. Uh, maybe do a tour and uh, talk to uh, to Brian, the founder. Great. So in a little bit, we're going to talk to you about squishy circuits and some of the, the projects you can do with those. Um, but we thought it would be much more interesting to find a neat place to live uh, hang out today from rather than, than my house. Um, so conveniently, we have a pretty amazing makerspace uh, in the Twin Cities. And the mill, where we are today, was founded by Brian Boyle. Um, so Brian, I'll tell us a little bit about why you started a makerspace and what, what a makerspace is. Well, a makerspace is a... a a facility that allows people to come, they can join it, and they can access things like laser cutting, CNC equipment, uh, woodworking equipment. We've got a CNC plasma cutter here. But more importantly, you can access other people. And you can collaborate on projects. You can learn about things that uh, you kind of never imagined you'd be learning about until you showed up and you saw the cool things that other people are doing. Um, the mill started out just, uh, I guess, it was something that uh, I've always been interested in. and. I had the feeling that there was other people out there that were interested in it too. And so I got some like-minded folks together, um, Greg Flanagan being one of them, and uh, we, uh, we built the mill. And here it is. And it's, uh, there's people coming in here working on different projects. And overall, it's just a lot of fun. So we thought we'd take you on a bit of a tour and show you what it looks like. Yeah, Thank that'd you. be awesome. Awesome. So well, you'll walk with me. We'll take a computer. Thank you so much for letting us be here, Brian. Certainly. So. As we walk around, we're going to go into the main, the main shop. Let's see if you can even peek through a window here. Um, conveniently, and we didn't even stage this, but if you see back the, the orange shirted gentleman at, the, at the, the shop bot there, that's actually Bruce Shapiro, who is the creator of the egg bot. Very um, cool. Familiar with, who happens to be here today working literally by chance. Uh, and we also got here and found out that we're a few weeks after the Red Bull design challenge that some of you may have followed. And conveniently, David is one of the designers who built the, the remind me your team's name. Uh, 1.21 Jiggernauts. Oh, actually, Jigger, and we can uh, even show you their flag. Yeah, we were actually uh, last year's winner of the whole contest, and this year we're a winner. So we'll be at Maker Fair with our uh, carnival game here. Yes, yeah, so you have to see this. They had one weekend to just build some, what was the challenge? It was to build a game. The game of games is the challenge, and this is our creation. It's a giant rocking carnival game style uh, submarine simulator. Awesome. Uh, run by a number of Arduinos, and we have, uh, we're actually working on doing some safety improvements for Maker Fair right now, but um, you know, when you're dousing water and have a bunch of Arduinos, we have to make sure it's, uh, it's nicely uh, sealed up. We didn't have time to do everything in the 72 hours. So we're working on some little upgrades, but basically we have a giant rocking chassis here that's dri driven by a uh, hospital bed actuator. We have our Ford Festiva shock absorbers here. Um, and then you have a number of uh, alarms that go off. You have a, a certain time period, like two or three seconds, to find the uh, appropriate alarm, you know, and hit the button here and shut it off before you get doused with water. And if you can do a number of, uh, of those in a, in a timely period, you come out dry and you're a, uh, you're a winner. But uh, if you're slow and you don't find them, that's, uh, you're going to get wet at Maker Faire. So. And, and given, uh, given the summer we're having in Minnesota, losing might be fun. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, we conceived of it in 98 degree weather. So that's, uh, that's why we went this direction. But yeah, she's uh, about ready to ship to New York. Awesome. Well, uh, we'll be looking for that at New York Maker Fair. Very cool. Thanks, David. Thank, Thank you. You. Yeah. So you can see some of their other workspaces. It's really starting to become a hub for people, makers in the Twin Cities. Uh, this is their, their wood shop. 
Very cool. And we're during the day. At night, they have lots of classes, everything from build your own 3D printer to soap making. That's a pretty big range. Pretty big range. And, and we'll, 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 one more introduction here. Greg is the operations director. Hi, guys. Hey, Greg. My training, right? That's right. Uh, my dad was a shop teacher, so uh, I, I learned a lot from him when I was growing up, and I'm having a ton of fun here now. And I, I can't, one of my favorite areas here, the amazing sewing area. <laughs> so that is the, the quick tour of the mill. But if any of you out there find yourselves in Minnesota, I'm, I'm sure they, it, it's one of the places you should definitely check out. Very cool. Well, uh, thank you for that tour, uh, Emery. And so, uh, Jonah, do you want to give a little talk and shout out to uh, what you've been working on and some of your projects? Uh, again, Jonah. Cohn, uh, winner of the Google Maker Fair, is that right, for the ages uh, 13 to 14? Oh uh, yeah, the Google Science Fair. Actually. Google Science Fair, excuse me, excuse me, sorry. And so what did you, what did you build, what was your project, and kind of uh, what was I, the process? My project was about um, helping deaf people hear music through, through tactile sound or actually vibration. <laughs> sorry, that was our speakers, Jonah. Was you your speakers? Sorry about that. <laughs> I apologize, Jonah. Oh uh, yeah, it's fine. So, um, what do you, what exactly should I explain? Um, well, so the project was how you could help deaf people interpret music, and how do they hear? Is that? Oh uh, no, it was, it was helping them experience music through um, through tactile sound. Or actually, tactile sound is basically vibration. Okay, and how did you accomplish that? Um, well, I conceived a device which takes um, the music that you put into it and it splits it up into outputs that I have that go to vibrating speakers. And the vibrating speakers are in contact with your body. And your brain translates the vibration signals into music. Wow. Very cool. And how, how did you think of this idea? Was there like a, a certain like brain uh, kind of, idea? Or? No, there is kind of a backstory to it. I was actually in a classroom with my friend and wanted to play guitar and couldn't hear the guitar at all. And we figured out that if you put your teeth on the very top of the guitar, on the head of the guitar, then you can hear it no matter how loud it is around you. Oh. Hmm. Very cool. And so what was it like? Uh, did you travel anywhere for this? Or like what's, what, how, what is the actual uh, contest? Uh, well, the contest started as, as an online application. You had to, I had to fill out um, about 10 pages worth of um, of details about the experiment, and I submitted it to Google Judges, and from there it was limited to 90 semi-finalists, and then um, 15 finalists, and the 15 finalists went to um, Mountain View actually for an actual competition. Very cool. Was it fun to kind of travel around with your project and show it off? Oh uh, yeah, definitely. Very cool. So do you have any pr uh, plans for like a, a follow-up project to this, or is there like uh, something else in the works? I definitely want to develop something, but um, I'm kind of in the middle of thinking of that. So. <laughs> cool. Well, yeah, keep us tuned for, uh, for the latest. That's awesome. Um, so, Anne-Marie, uh, you're also sitting there next to, uh, to Matt, uh, Matt Schmidtbauer. So, Matt, do you want to chime in and uh, introduce yourself and kind of what you do? I hear you do beekeeping. Uh, you're a student. You've got a company going. Uh, the list yeah. goes on. Um, so yeah, I'm a, I'll be a senior now this year at the University of St. Thomas. This is actually where uh, Squishy Circuits was developed with Anne-Marie and uh, a couple other students. And yeah, I have a lot of different things that I do. I'm an electrical engineering and physics major, uh, so that's what I'm doing. But on my free time, I, I have been beekeeping since I was 12. <laughs> uh, so that's my hobby away from technology and Squishy Circuits. How many, how many hives do you have? Uh, I have 10 right now. Uh, so, 10 beehives? <laughs> Beehives, and each beehive um, probably right now has about eighty to one hundred thousand bees in it. Uh, so I have a lot of bees. <laughs> yeah, uh, actually had a, only a decent year, um, and I extracted this weekend. I got sixteen gallons of honey. Um, so usually I get about double that, but uh, you take what you can get. There's good years and there's bad years. Yeah, a lot of honey. Oh, yeah, I mean, 16 wow. gallons is a lot of honey. And do you, uh, do you sell it at a market, or do you just share with friends, or what's the, what's the end result for the honey? I, I, I do sell most of it. Uh, I grew up in a really small town, and we had this tractor show. And uh, I go to this tractor show, and I sell honey there every year. And people always come back, and they like my honey, and they 
I guess, like talking to me. So. Very cool. And so uh, you also have. Uh, oh, sorry. Something else. Ahead. I was say, do you also have uh, developed a company? Is that right? Yeah, um, so when I started working with Emory and Squishy Circuits, uh, we used to go to all these events, and people would always ask, you know, where can I get this stuff? that I can just do the project and I don't really have to find everything. Yeah, we thought we were being helpful listing all of the individual places to right. go buy it, but sure. not right. helpful enough. Right. So Matt, Matt had the great idea to actually develop his own kit. Yeah, so this is like the squishy circuit kit, I call it. And it's like a uh, battery pack, um, buzzers, LEDs, and then a motor. And so that's kind of the kit. Um, it's kind of a small little company, but I sell them in the maker shed and things like that. And so it's taking off, and I've learned a lot from it. Um, been a good learning experience, and I've actually had a lot of fun with it. So, as a professor, it was really neat to watch Matt take the project by himself and actually figure out where to get the stuff manufactured and forming an LLC. Uh, so, quite a lesson in, in maker entrepreneurship. Uh, Very cool. Yeah. Well, then, Anne Marie, can you kind of go into a little bit more about yourself? Uh, sounds like you were a professor, and um, you helped with your students develop the squishy circuits, and um, just kind of how have you become a maker, and how did you start out? Sure. So I'm lucky. I always knew exactly what I wanted to be when I grew up. Um, so I was I was lucky from day one. I knew I wanted to be an actress or a painter. <laughs> that didn't work out so well. I, I've seen videos of my high school theater shows, and it's making a little more sense now why there wasn't complete support from my family on that regard. Uh, but you know, I found when I hit around high school, I found that that engineering um, and making things. That was a career that was close to art. Um, really, as I, as I wanted, I could create things. Engineers created new things. Uh, so I decided I switched gears and decided I wanted to, no pun intended, go to school for engineering. Um, and I had grown up doing a lot of sailing um, and was really, really interested in water things. Um, and I found myself at MIT uh, in Cambridge, in Massachusetts. And they, at the time, they don't anymore, but they had a separate major in ocean engineering. So I studied ocean engineering, a lot of underwater robots. Um, I did some internships actually out in California in Monterey. Um, and we did robots, everything from you know, little smart robots that swam around. I got to work with some amazing engineers who were developing ones that looked for shipwrecks. Um, so as a student, I got to go on a, looking for shipwrecks in Greece one summer. Um, and awesome. I found I really wanted to teach. Um, and so I got a doctorate in engineering. At the time, I was also teaching at an art school. Um, and really found that this art engineering connection was there. And honestly, it's a lot of what we see in making. Uh, it's how do you bring together the art and the technology and, and ideas and really bring them to fruition. Um, so I did spend six years as an engineering professor. I'm in Minnesota at the University of St. Thomas. And I was the person who taught machine design and engineering design, a lot of the classes on how do you build stuff. Uh, how do you get your ideas to a laser cutter or to a, to a mill? Uh, again, no pun intended, I guess, where we're filming from. Um, real mills and the, and, and the, the places that do. Um, and I really was becoming so interested in education work um, and the growing maker movement that actually I'm now on leave from my professorship and I lead the Maker Education Initiative, uh, which is a new nonprofit that is trying to give every kid the chance to become a maker. How do we all as makers work together to give opportunities to all kids to do the, the amazing things um, that many of us are getting to play with these days? Awesome. Well, very cool. Uh, is now a good transition to the project of the day, talk about squishy circuits and uh, how we can kind of play with them and mess around? Sure, we'd love to. So at the heart of this really is Play-Doh. Um, and I, I will admit this project came out of about my third year of engineering. I was watching a lot of the work that Lee was doing at MIT and sewn circuits. And I saw groups that were painting circuits and thought, wouldn't it be cool if we could sculpt circuits? And there had been some people who had used Play-Doh in combination with things like the Pico Crickets. So uh, Mitch Resnick's group at MIT had done some, some work with the Pico Crickets and, and Play-Doh. And we said, wouldn't it be cool if we could build circuits where we didn't have wires? We got rid of all the wires, and we replaced them with Play-Doh. Um, and we had a, a student who was actually a first-year engineering student, uh, Sam Johnson, and he spent his summer researching Play-Doh and making a bunch of different Play-Doh recipes. And by the end of the summer, what he found was that we could do this. We could take some Play-Doh and plug in a battery pack. So what we have here is a four uh, AA battery pack. Okay. I'm going to plug it into some Play-Doh. And this is, there are two recipes we posted today um, on, on the Google Plus page. This is the Solly one. Um, so this is the conductive Play-Doh. And I am going to then stick an LED, a little light emitting diode, into. And you'll see that, let's see, can you see if I turn it? Can you see light? Mm -hmm. It's always a little harder on a camera, but we have an LED that's lit up. Um, we could also be really annoying to you for a second and give you a buzzer. So my, my daughters, that's their favorite. How noisy can they make the circuits? We could even stick a motor in. 
Alright, so if I take a motor. Pull out the light. A little piece of dough so you can see it spinning. Otherwise, it's my word for it that it's spinning. Right. Oh, it helps if I plug in the battery pack. There we go. So I've got a little motor spinning there. It's actually spinning so fast, I'll shoot it off at you. All right. right. This is the first basic project was, all right, we've got this dough that conducts enough that we could start sculpting. We could put lots of LEDs. I do this a lot with my kids, and their favorite task is how many LEDs can they all get lit, lit up? I think I saw one preschool class that had like 15 of them lit up in there. And so one thing I will say is for those of you at home who made the, the conductive Play-Doh, um, we have information on our website about how conductive it is. But you can also use regular commercial Play-Doh if you don't okay. feel like, like making the dough uh, from scratch. It, can, it, conducts, it has about half, um, half the, the conducting ability. Um, so the resistance is about twice as high. But it works fine for the lights and for most motors and for most buzzers. So that was the basic project, was we got this conductive dough. And you know the fun thing is we can start talking, particularly to people who are new to circuits, about things like short circuits. So as I guess many of you know, Jonah probably better than any of us know that you know, if we connect these wires together, the electricity will run through the dough, because it's got a lower resistance than the LED, and turn off the lights. Right? So we can start shorting out our circuits. Probably the, the more obvious one, uh, watching at home. <laughs> And I'll, I'll stop that before, <laughs> before everyone's ears. So the next thing we said was, well, if, if, if salty Play-Doh can conduct electricity, can we make something that doesn't conduct electricity? Can we make a non-conductive Play-Doh? And we did very scientific research. We went to all the literature for this. And for us, that consisted of you know 101 rainy day activities for your toddler um, and, and lots of uh, preschool books on different recipes for Play-Doh. Very uh, scholarly. <laughs> Very scholarly. Though I will say, I mean, there is actually a body of work on liter uh, literature on Play-Doh, um, because many high school teachers have done exercises measuring the resistance of lengths of Play-Doh. Okay. Uh, so, you know, as a as a lab to see how how the resistance changes. Uh, so so there was that literature, but we were looking at different recipes, and many of us who have made homemade Play-Doh, it often has salt in it. Um, but there are other recipes, and that's rolling rolling in here in the back, that use sugar. Um, because when you look at what conducts in, in the Play-Doh, really it's the salt, um, and it's the fact that we're using tap water, so there's a lot of, a lot of ions in there for, to conduct. We made a second Play-Doh recipe. Um, this was also thanks to Sam, and this one has no added salt in it. Um, as you okay. saw, it's oil, it's flour, it's, it's sugar, lots of sugar. Um, apparently it tastes really good, but I wouldn't recommend that after having your hands all over it. Sure. And the, the, the other trick there is that while the salt is one of the things that causes the conducting in the conducting Play-Doh, it's also that you use tap water. Right? There's, there's more than just H2O in your tap water. So to get the, the most resistant and most insulating um, Play-Doh, you want to use distilled or deionized water. Uh, we were lucky. We developed the project at a university, so we could get deionized water from the chem labs. You can sure. buy it from a lot of lab supply stores. You can also find distilled water um, in a lot of grocery stores. Um, so that's that's where we found a lot of people uh, finding it. Uh, <clears throat> so we have this one. It it has it does conduct, but how many more times resistant is it? Um, thirty thousand. No, uh, yeah, twenty thousand times. So if you're used to looking at resistors, and the higher the number, the least the less you know least amount of current it, it lets through. Sure. This is thirty thousand times the resistance of the the salt one. So it's not truly insulating, but we feel that thirty thousand times. Pretty close. Not that we can say it's it's pretty close. So before, when we, if we had our light or our buzzer, so you've got, our, you've got, you can see the light. Can you see that it's on? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So then, if we push it together, right, the light goes off. Yeah. That's our short circuit. So if I, if I took some of the conducting dough and put it in between, right, I basically I've made a bridge. The light turns out. If I take our insulating dough and put that in between, right, it's still lit up because. All right. that so there is acting really like a barrier. It's not letting much current through. I'm sure if we measured it, a little bit of current is getting through because it's not a perfect insulator. But it's, it works fine to start building some kind of more interesting circuits. Um, so, Amory, can I ask you and Matt, how do you measure the conductivity of the Play-Dohs, and how did you figure out you get that crazy large number? So um, you can measure the resistance of the dough based on the shape that it's in. And so if you put it in a known shape, like uh, I would put it in a pipe, 
mm -hmm. and you know the known and you know the the width of it, and you know the length, you can figure out a property called the resistivity, and that's kind of a it's a property that's specific to every material, yep. and so we can figure out the resistivity of Play-Doh and of like conductive dough ends up being about nine ohm inches. So if you plug that into the equation where you know the cross-sectional area and the length, you can generate the resistance. And then this one ends up being, um, yeah, 300,000. I don't remember the actual number. Just Big, it. big number. <laughs> right. Um, so yeah, that's, that's in a nutshell how you do it. And all that research that we did is online on the website. And if you want some great reading material. <laughs> awesome. And does that have anything to do with the parts per million of like the salt or the ions in the dough, or what's what's actually being conductive? I know you said we have to use distilled tap water, right? Oh, the well, resistance first, dough. Yeah, so so really, it is the salt and and it's the the stuff in the tap water, right? So if you had perfectly clean tap water, uh, you know that that wouldn't conduct. But I grew up sailing, and so whenever there's a lightning storm, obviously you want to get off the water right away, right? Because the, the salt water conducts electricity. You want to get out of there. So does your tap water. Uh, so, you know, in some ways, that the the more impure the water, the more this is probably going to conduct. Right. Um, our, the the Play-Doh that some of you made at home, this is really, really salty. Um, Sam and Matt have spent a lot of time staring over a stove to see just how much salt they can get into Play-Doh. We think we've maxed out the recipe. Um, Pretty much at a point where even if you would get more salt in there, it doesn't really help the conductivity. Because it is Play-Doh after all, it's not a wire. Very cool. So Yuli, uh, you were actually experimenting with some of the conductive Play-Doh and non-conductive Play-Doh earlier in the lab. Um, did you find similar results? Were you able to light up your LEDs? Um, yeah, but they weren't like that bright when I did them, but then if I like took out a little bit of Play-Doh, then they worked a little bit better. Interesting. What kind of battery pack were you using? Um, just these little ones. Nine volts? Yeah. So we, we will say, we typically use a six, we use four double A's. Um, we've heard a lot of groups that have used nine volts. One thing we'll warn you um, is, so if you're camping, you've probably seen some of the past projects that used LEDs. When you do an LED circuit, you typically have your, your, your LED, you typically have your battery pack, and you typically have a resistor. Um, because usually your battery pack has too much current, um, so if I was to attach my LED directly to the battery pack, and I'm not going to do it, I, maybe if I was wearing safety glasses and pointing it away, I would do it, it'll, it'll likely burn it out. Um, and in some cases, depending on how, you know, the, the voltage and current for your battery pack and the LED, you could cause it to pop, which would be, would be an eye hazard. Um, so you never want to attach the LED directly to the battery pack. Um, and when you build a typical circuit on your prototyping boards, you have a resistor. And what the resistor is doing um, is it's basically reducing the amount of current that then is going to go through the LED. Um, so we're taking advantage of the fact, as Matt said, the Play-Doh, it's not really a wire. Um, the resistance of wire is really low. The resistance of this, it's low, but it's not as low as a regular wire. So if, we're, if we were doing this in an electrical engineering class or a class on electronics, I would say, you know, this, this isn't really a wire. This is a wire with a resistor built in. Uh, so that's an important thing to remember um, is that you really don't want to hook it up. Long, skinny, uh, it would have more resistance than the same length that was really wide. You kind of think of it as a pipe with water flowing through it. If you had a really long pipe that's really big, it could hold a lot, a lot of, it would be pretty easy for water to go through. But if you had a really long pipe that's really, really small, it would be kind of hard for water to go through there. Hmm. Does that make sense? But in general, one thing you can try at home is if you did that sort of simple circuit with the two long tubes of dough that we did, so a little wreath, right? And so all we did was do a, an outer ring of the conductive dough, um, an inner ring of the insulating dough, and a little ball in the center of the, the purple dough. Um, and it's sort of our, our Christmas tree for our sushi circuit. We can plug in the battery pack. So I've got the, the positive and the negative, and then I plugged in all these LEDs, um, and so we can make a little a little wreath. And if you go to the actually Squishy Circuits website, there's a link to our Facebook page, and you'll find you know, Matt had to spend a lot of his time doing resistance measurements, so we could we could use these for other projects, and he'll show you some of the Arduino ones in a minute. But he also got to spend some of his time trying to make the most complicated sculptures he could. So he had a pretty good uh, series of holiday Squishy Circuits, and they're they're posted. So you can see the, the gingerbread men and the, the American flags and I think a few others. Yeah. Um, Very cool. He's posting so you, on, on, on the, the Google Plus page. We'd love to see what you're making. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. And use the, the MakerCamp hashtag to, uh, so we can all share and find it. Um, one thing I'm curious, with that little kind of sushi roll, you really have to have both kinds of conductive and non-conductive Play-Doh to make it work, right? You want to make sure that both the positive and negative kind of terminals of the battery are separated? 
Yeah, so one of the questions we get a lot is what role is the, the um, food coloring having? And it really isn't having any. Um, so you know, you, it doesn't have to be white for your insulating. Uh, I'm sure you could find some food dyes that did have great conducting abilities, but we're just using it to make them, them colorful. Uh, though actually when we were doing our reading on the conductivity of Play-Doh, we did find, and your, your data found this too, that if you use commercial Play-Doh and you measure the resistance, um, it does vary by color. Right. Oh, interesting. So Did you find uh, which color was better for being conductive? Do I don't remember offhand. To um, be honest, for the, the highly scientific work of building squishy circuits that are shaped like sushi rolls, you don't really notice the difference. <laughs> um, but if you're doing it for your, for your research project, then you, you, can, you can measure that. And I think Matt posted all of this data on our website. So feel right. free to look at that and, and email him. Yeah. Any what, uh, what is that website, Anne-Marie? Can you uh, give us the, like, the URL or the link? Yeah, so the best thing is just Google squishy circuits. Uh, it's sort of a long university website, but if you Google squishy circuits, that'll, that should be your first tip. Cool. Um, and, it's, and it's posted in the Google Plus post for today, this morning's camper post. Awesome. Along with the instructions and the materials. Instructions and materials, yep. Very cool. Do you want to see some Arduino projects? Absolutely, yeah. I'm going to turn it over to Matt. OK, let's see what we have here. So this is probably the most popular okay. Arduino project that we have. Bring it down a little bit. And we call this one uh, squishy sound. And remember how we said that the resistance is determined by the shape of the dough. Well, what this Arduino is doing is, is it measures the resistance of the dough. So if I stick one battery terminal in this side and one on the other side, and it's going to make a noise when I plug it in. And the pitch will go higher the higher the resistance is. Let's see if this works. OK, so you can hear that tone. It said, if I make this thinner, the resistance would go up. And you can hear that pitch going up little by little. Until I disconnect them. Now there's no current being able to go through there. And so this is one project that we do. And like I said, it's all based on the resistance of the bill. I'll plug that, save our ears a little bit. Sure. Uh, and it, it, you know the Pico crickets. This is very similar to a project that Mitch Resnick and the uh, Lifelong Kindergarten group did with the, the Pico crickets. This is sort of the Arduino grandchild of that project. Yeah, it's kind of got, like a theremin also, kind of um, like a theremin project. We kind of use like the light, the infrared, to kind of play a harp sound. Let's see if this one works. Let's see if this one does work. OK, so then this one is the same concept. Now uh, you see there's one bulb lighting up. And if I make it thinner, the bulb will dim because it's harder for the electricity to go through and eventually go out. Or I can make the bulb brighter um, by putting that dough back together. So then again, this one's also based on the resistance of the dough. Uh, you could take it one step further with the bulbs. Um, let's see. Thank you. And this one just has three bulbs. And if you're familiar with a, uh, a pixel, like on a TV or a computer screen, a lot of times it's three different, um, three different colors, and then it mixes those colors. So there's a green one, and a red one, and the last one will be blue. And if it would be dark in here, and I had a, uh, a mixing board, I could put it over here, and it would look like white light. Because you, in, in colors, when you mix those three colors, it turns into a white. Um, and then you can really make any color you want by uh, making one bulb dimmer or brighter. Um, and you can make any color in spectrum. It works beautiful when you have a what yeah. you use in front. We use just a piece of like a semi-translucent plexiglass. Um, and it works really well with a dark room. If, if you go online, we have a video of it that shows it kind of well. Um, and also instructions for all the projects and Arduino uh, sketches. Yeah, the code and everything. So, so I'm kind of curious. Jonah, um, kind of after seeing some of the, the speakers and the sound instruments that you could do with that, do you think there's a way to kind of incorporate the squishy circuits maybe into one of your future projects? Um, I, I would have to think about that. I mean, there are definitely a billion different things you could do with those, but that would be a hard one. Well, and the, the fun thing is we found a lot of little kids who, who have played with us. So I have a four-year-old and a two-year-old daughter, and they, they play with squishy circuits, and we've seen that at Maker Fair. So maybe we'll get them started on the squishy circuits, Jonah, and then send them to you for, for the more advanced ones. Right, right. <laughs> Very cool. And so, Brian, have you ever used uh, the squishy circuits in the lab? Um, or have you tested out or used motors or servos or anything kind of? In the lab, we've done a, 
We've done a couple different things in the lab just because it's kind of a common thing we build around here for testing or when someone's going to give a talk. It's a great way to get people interacting, very easy to do and have a lot of fun. Um, so we've done LEDs, like what you were saying earlier, how many LEDs can we put on and see if it works. Motors. Um, we've done a couple times with, uh, with buzzers and stuff like that. But usually they get irritating pretty quickly, and if you have a bunch of people doing this, it gets really, really loud. So we try to stay away from the buzzers. Uh, but motors and LEDs, mostly of what we've done with it. And Josie, I know you've made quite a few batches uh, in getting ready for events like Maker Fair and other talks. Uh, what are some issues you run into when making the dough, and uh, how do you test it to make sure it's working? Well, just make sure you add the right amounts of various things. Like I think one time. I'm a notoriously bad cook, and um, like as a joke, I basically say caramel's not hard to make because I caramelize everything. And so anyway, I saw a quarter cup of salt, and I added a quarter teaspoon, and it wasn't working. So just be very, very careful with the right amounts. Um, the first time I made it, it was not working, and so I added a bunch more salt, and then it glowed bright with a bunch of LEDs in it. So just be careful. One thing about the dough is it's relatively forgiving, so it's good. Mm -hmm. And if, if you're making the, the insulating dough, since that has a lot of sugar in it, if you're doing it outside a lot, this one this is the one that will get moldy pretty quickly. We do find the salty dough can last for a bit. Um, how long would you say? Maybe a month if you yeah. keep it sealed up real tight. Wow, that long, really? Yeah, because it's got so much salt in it. On the other hand, this is sugary, and if you think about things in your kitchen that might mold faster, the sugary one doesn't last as long. Um, if you go back, the, actually the very first time we showed this project anywhere, it was in Make Magazine, um, mm -hmm. way back a bit. And you might notice the recipe is a little different there. We used to use alum. And alum is a, is a salt. Um, and it's typically used in pickle making. Um, and if you put some of that in and you find the old recipe, it does last longer. Um, when I initially challenged my students to make this, I said the criteria was they had to be able to find the materials in our local grocery store. Um, so we had no problem with that recipe. Uh, we did find, though, that Minnesota, um, maybe it's that we make more pickles for our state fair and such, but it's a pickle. It's used a lot for pickling. So if you go to any of the grocery stores that we've done this project as our, our test stores, we've always found alum. But as this project grew, um, particularly internationally, we found that alum is almost impossible to find elsewhere. Uh, so that's why we did change the recipe. It honestly makes this more insulating, because alum does, is a salt. Um, however, it does make, if you don't use the alum, it doesn't last as long. So we've ditched the alum, um, but we know that we have to make this pretty much fresh for every event. Um, the other fun thing we learned is it's really hard to find um, cream of tartar in a lot of places. Japan and France, it's pretty hard to find cream of tartar, uh, particularly if you're not in big cities. So we, we do post um, that if you don't have cream of tartar, and this was on today's instructions too, you can substitute with lemon juice. Oh, OK. The other common, if you're trying to do this with, with the kids you work with or a class, the other thing to be aware of is a lot of people can't um, tolerate gluten, right? So if you've seen gluten-free menus. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the things, obviously, that, that is a problem with gluten is flour. So we, use, we make this using standard flour, and it works quite well. Um, but we've worked with some schools where they, they aren't allowed to use the, in the class. They don't, they don't use flour-based things. So you can use gluten-free doughs as well. We've, it's a little harder sometimes to get the texture right. Um, but you can replace just the standard white flour with a gluten-free flour. Good to know. Yeah, the fun of opening the project up and posting it on a website is that we have gotten we have gotten suggestions from around the world for changes uh, on the recipes, and we've gotten to see workshops from around the world and some applications we would never have thought of. Well, I'm kind of curious, Matt. Um, when Amory came to you and kind of said, "Do you want to do some research about Play-Doh?" What was your reaction? Are you just kind of like, "What are you talking about?" Or actually, it was the other way around. Um, <laughs> I heard about this job opening, and I would I went online and looked at it and said, "Geez, this is this is Play-Doh." And it's conducting electricity. This is cool, right? <laughs> I love this as a kid, and uh, kind of a motto. I try to like, I don't know, not live by. One of my mottos is like, you should learn through playing things. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of all my life. I realized a lot of my experiences and a lot of the things I know are because I would start beekeeping and do this random stuff and have to learn how to do stuff that would coincide with that. And uh, I feel like this is a really good example of that get people involved in something that's playful, but really, really helps them grasp electronics. And so she lured me in with that philosophy. I always wonder, though, what the, when my research students, the first call home, typically their first year engineering students, that first call home of, I have a research job, yeah. and it's on Play-Doh. 
It's a great litmus <laughs> test for collaborators, though. If I, bring, if I bring other people down into the lab and they, they smile and they're like a kid and they're building stuff, I want to work with them. Uh, and, and if they are, I've had people hold it and say, why? It usually probably isn't my next collaborator. Not the, not the best bet, yeah. Well, I'm actually interested, Jonah, too. So how did you learn um, to do these things with sound and get interested in science? Um, was it at school or at home? or? I actually can't remember how I started science, but I know what really helped me in this project was um, I started learning, I guess, how to make things and how to build things. The first thing I did, I think it was two years ago, I actually decided one day that I was going to try and build my own electric guitar. And that was kind of the first big project I ever took. <laughs> yeah. I had a daughter and how to work with all the wood. And I guess that slight knowledge of soldering that I got from that was um, when I could build me. Yeah, it's a little hard to hear you, um, kind of the, their last comment, but I think you were saying, you know, having a project like the guitar, at least I've found, is a really good way to learn a lot of things at one time. You have a lot, a lot more focus. You know, you, you want to make the guitar, you learn the woodworking skills, you want to learn the electronics, you learn how to solder. Um, yeah, what I, other kinds of things have you built? Um, well, I guess other than um, this project right now and the guitar probably, that's, that's, that's it. That's a pretty good start. Awesome first project. Yeah. Uh, a yeah. Guitar. Fantastic. How about uh, Yuli? Are you working on any projects, or uh, do you have any experiments you'd want to build in the future? I don't know. Just whatever I find out that's cool that I want to do. And Brian, I know you're a uh, mechanical engineer. Uh, talking to Anne Marie about mechanics. Um, are you working on any projects at home? I think you have like a lathe you're building and yeah, I'm projects. Just I'm rebuilding my lathe. Um, I'm almost done with that. I'm finishing up my CNC mill that I, that I got. And what I'm actually going to start pretty quickly here is um, we have an epilog laser here in the lab, and I want to do a rotary attachment. Well, last night, uh, the other, one of the other interns and I pulled the machine apart. We're cleaning it and getting it recalibrated and everything like that. And I figured out what the pinout for the connector is. So over the next couple of weeks here, I'm going to build a rotary attachment for the laser so we don't have to spend the $1,000 or whatever it is to buy one. And then those will probably, I'll probably post those on Make Projects as well as the tag, the Maker Camp. So if you guys have access to an epilogue laser or have one, you can you build this and use it yourself. And Josie, how about yourself? Any projects that you're working on or uh, any things you've uh, accomplished and can tell about? Um, well, I've also uh, experimented in uh, Lou 3 uh, as well as uh, Jonah did. Like, I, uh, I started out with like an electric cigar box ukulele. So that was one of those projects I made the net and all that. And, uh, now, um, I guess I'm working on basically repainting my bike, which is new for me because I've never really taken apart a bike before or done anything with it, so I'm learning a whole bunch about that. And that's one of my big projects. Uh, and then I'm also working on sewing a pantsuit. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Well, I'm kind of curious if, you know, there's a lot of different ideas and projects going around. Maybe we can start with Amory and Matt, but if you want to learn more, where do you guys go for more ideas and information? Do you go online? Is it books? Um, um, I go to the internet, and these people around <laughs> help out a whole lot. <laughs> Any like specific websites though? Like, I know there's Make Projects, Instructables. There's like the Make Scene blog. Um, just cool places for ideas for the campers could kind of check out. There's CNC Cookbook. Um, that's a really good site for more industrial machining and projects like that. Um, I use YouTube more than anything because most people are posting things, so there's videos that companies have posted about a new product they're releasing to kind of get ideas. And then just being involved in robotics growing up, it's like I met a bunch of people through robotics and stuff like that, and they're always posting different things, using how I get my resources. Yeah, maybe Amory and Matt, do you guys have any comments for that? Just uh, if you have a personal hobby you're working on, where do you go for more ideas? Can you go to the, the mill? And talk to more people and kind of get uh, collaboration going, or so it definitely sounds like that today. I mean, some of the projects that are walking by are pretty incredible, and we didn't stage it at all, and we just happen to have the Eggbot Inventor and the the Gigawatts team mm -hmm. here working 
Um, you know, honestly, I've spent quite a few years working with teachers looking for projects for their classes, and you mentioned Instructables and Make Projects. Uh, Adafruit has got some great tutorials for electronics. Uh, so does SparkFun and their new education page. Uh, so those are, those are some of the places I've been looking. Uh, the current hobby in my house is my daughter's learning how to sew. So we found, honestly, just going to the stores themselves and browsing. She loves looking at fabric and patterns, and her mom's not quite talented enough to make most of the ones she picks, but really meeting the people. Um, we're pretty lucky we're in Minnesota, so next week is a big deal here. Um, the Minnesota State Fair opens on Thursday, and our State Fair goes 12 days and has over 120,000 people most days with huge fine art tents and sewing tents and food tents and huge 4-H presence. So 4-H students take over um, a whole building for the whole 12 days. They stay overnight. They do shows. They show the things they've built. They did a little underwater ROVs, remotely operated vehicles, uh, a year or two ago. Um, so honestly, I love. I look forward to going next week with my kids and wandering and getting ideas for projects that way. Uh, very similar to a Maker Fair. It's always fun. You can walk around and meet the people who are doing those projects. Um, so I love little stores where I can meet people who really know how to use the tools. Um, I had some run-ins. I trying to find woodworking tools for my daughter. Um, and I will admit, I pretended she was eight when I went to the store, and I asked at a big store whether they had suggestions for tools for my eight-year-old, and they said she was too young. Um, the truth was, she's actually four, and so then when I went to a little smaller shop where they really knew their tools, they had great suggestions for tools for her. So I'm still a fan of, particularly since we live in a city, going to stores and meeting the makers and what they use. Definitely recommend finding, finding uh, maker spaces near you, too. So we're lucky to have the mill here, but we have quite a bunch of them. Uh, in fact, some that are kid-focused here in the Twin Cities. So I'd definitely encourage finding the maker and hacker spaces in your communities. For me, I guess, so I always have these weird ideas. And I don't even know who to talk to about them. Or with, you know, I come up with these things, and I'm like, well, I don't even know who to start with. And so I just go to the library, and I just pick up books. I, I'm a big fan of nonfiction reading. And even if, I, even if I don't necessarily read it cover to cover, if I just peruse, I'm like, peruse the book and go, hey, this is actually useful information. And I do a lot of that stuff. Just grab every book out of that, you know, do we just big stack. Right yeah, I just grab that whole thing and they're like, what are you doing? And they're like, I just, yeah. Well, it's exciting because so many libraries are starting to get interested in making and we're hearing of maker spaces right. and libraries, you could grab the stack and then, you know, print something next time. Exactly. So I like to go to the library. Awesome. Well, I'm getting a question in from some campers. They're asking about, have there ever been any disastrous experiments when you're developing the squishy circuits? A lot of moldy dough. A lot of moldy dough. That was for you, I think. Mm. I left the bag of it. Yeah. Um, you know, so disastrous experiments. You know, one thing we did caution about is we have seen LEDs pop if you put them directly on a battery pack, and that, could, mm -hmm. that would be an eye hazard. So if you're doing this with little kids, we have awesome, brightly colored safety glasses we use, and you'll notice I, I'm wearing glasses doing this, um, which are pretty thick. <laughs> uh, so that disastrous experiments, that would really be it. Um, some some soupy Play-Doh and crystally Play-Doh. Yeah, if you, if you don't put cream of tartar or lemon juice in the Play-Doh, it turns into a liquid. And uh, sometimes I don't read the recipe so well and I forget to do that. <laughs> and, and think hard before traveling with it. Um, you know, so as with any make project, you know, think through if you're flying somewhere where they're looking at your bags. You know, make sure things are labeled and you, you are polite and you talk through what you have. Because um, it is an unusual looking project, and we have friends who have run into some problems with that. And how about, uh, Amory, what's your favorite color that you've ever seen in a Squishy Circuits? My favorite color? Yeah, if you had to use one color for the rest of your Squishy Circuits, what would it be? For the dough? Well, so it's start, I must say, you probably have noticed, anytime you've seen me speak, our school, the school colors of St. Thomas, where Matt is and I was, are purple. Um, but I have to confess that my, my daughter's their favorite color is purple, so I, I am I am a tried and true purple squishy circuit person. How about you, Matt? Do you have a favorite color? I, uh, All the uh, the expert of Play-Doh that you are. Uh, I make a lot of it, so I should be no. Um, it's the blue. I like there's a there's a neon food coloring. It's it's not normal color blue. It's the neon colored blue. I really like that one. I don't know. Does that kind of like react under like uh, UV light, or it's just really a bright color? Really bright. It kind of looks like you know actual play doh is really really bright. It really, kind of looks like an actual play doh. And so, I must say one of my favorite projects these days of play doh though that that some of you may have seen is the Makey Makey. And so you can use regular play doh, but Makey Makey, which is a new little uh, basically a breakout board for your your computer, an Arduino powered one that basically lets you turn anything into an input device. Um, so of course as soon as we got one, we played with, with play doh because that's our default in our lab. 
Um, but yeah, even you know the commercial Play-Doh that comes out of the same group that that did a lot of some of the early Play-Doh and Cricut's work. Um, really fun tool. So I definitely say look look at some point of the Nikki Nikki as another add-on for your your Play-Doh and circuit experimenting. Um, or code one yourself since it is Arduino based. I have um, I have one question about the Play-Doh itself. If you if could you make combinations of like half sugar and half and half salt to make like different resistance? You should be able to. Um, I actually haven't done tons of research on it, and the question does come up a lot. Actually, we know that you can, because every time we do this at a fair, well, that's true. we start with really nicely <laughs> separated Play-Doh, and we end up with, you know... That. That? <laughs> so that definitely has less resistance. Um, we, haven't, we haven't calibrated it. Right, I haven't, I haven't actually done the measurements to see if it's a half, or even if you half and half, does it meet in the middle exactly? Or... That would make a lot more possibilities for, like, more intricate circuits, I guess. You're very right. Yeah, you know, and we've heard of people trying to play with some, um, I'm blanking on the word, is it photochromic, the dyes that change color based on um, the temperature? So if you remember the, the shirts in the 80s that you put your hand on and they change colors? Well, you can buy dyes for those, for fabric. Some people have played with that with a dough, so then when current's running through things, uh, it changes color. Uh, we haven't played with that yet, uh, yeah. but that's sort of a neat. We've had lots of people ask us if you could make a Play-Doh Play diode. Uh, let us know if you do. Uh, that'd be very cool. Uh, but Le electroluminescence, people want it to glow when electricity yep. is going through. That'd be cool. Yep. That'd be really cool. <laughs> so you can like, physically see where the electricity is going in your circuit and where it's not. So. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess once you make a diode, right, you could make a transistor pretty pretty quickly, yeah, right? That's question we've gotten an email a lot. We, do, we don't have that recipe. Um, but please design it and share it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make a squishy computer one day. Hand gate, or gate, something like that. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> So we've got a question from YouTube um, for Anne-Marie and Matt. Um, are there, do you guys have any tips for like getting kids involved in electronics? Yeah, you know, honestly, kids want to know how things work. So we have, we have done these workshops as young as three, um, so preschool classes. And the neat thing is we get emails from around the world that people have done it in their own classes. And we've heard of quite a few people who do this with three-year-olds um, and preschoolers. Um, and if you're trying to do it with really little kids, and I'll talk about some non-squishy circuit ways in a minute. But if you're doing squishy circuits, um, one thing that we often do to explain them is it's magical once you get it to light up the first time. But it's frustrating if you can't get it to light up. So we always go for that first aha, and then we build from there. Um, so if you are a little kid, or you're my little kid, and you look at this, it kind of looks like a little person with two legs. Um, so my, my way of explaining this to a little kid, um, and actually to my adult friends, is imagine that you're making Play-Doh shoes. And so I've got my battery pack on. I've got two purple Play-Doh shoes. And I need to put my little person in the shoes. And I plug them in. And if it doesn't light up, I say, oh, he must have his feet in the wrong shoes. And I turn him around. And now he lights up. And if they want to put both feet in the same shoe, I say, that's silly. Would you put both of your feet in the same shoe? <laughs> it sounds silly, um, but you know, once you've got that first light lit up, it's then so much easier to play with it because you know you can do it. Um, you know, so we really, I, I love doing squishy circuits for electronics with little kids. The Makey Makey, um, I, I've worked with a bunch of teachers who are planning on using that at some point in their classes, and even as young as kindergarten, they've been excited because um, that really gives you the idea of inputs and completing circuits. Also, um, paintable circuits. Um, so I, I love Bear Conductive, just came out with paint pens that are conductive paint that also kind of almost worked like cold solder because you can hold the place components on. Um, and that's something where you can just draw it. And I've had good luck with my daughter, who, who is a preschooler, with that. Um, the, the kind of combination of craft and, and, and the electronics. There's also some really cool sewn electronics. Those tend to be a little bit older, I think, to have the manual dexterity to sew it. Um, but I know at Maker Faire a few years ago, a group showed Feltronics. Uh, I think it was a hacker space in Charlotte that did a felt-based circuit. Um, but I'd say kind of the, the easy starting point you know, we're biased, squishy circuits are easy, especially if you really want to do it quickly and just grab commercial Play-Doh. Um, but then the other one I would say is look into paintable circuits. So you kind of mentioned it a little bit, Emery, but can I ask you more, what's the significance of using different batteries and different combinations of batteries? Like, uh, we have a bunch of 9-volt batteries in the lab. Could we just stick a bunch of 9 volts into the dough, or is there a danger of having too much voltage? Do you need more current to have the LEDs light up? Kind of what's yeah. a good recipe? So LEDs, right, if you, if you, they're rated for a certain voltage and current. So if you have too much voltage and current for them, typically they burn out, um, and then they're, they're useless. Um, or, you know, worst case scenario, and 
you put too much through, they could actually pop. Uh, since we do this a lot at fairs and at classrooms, we our goal has been we want this to be fun and easy, and we always go the lowest voltage possible. You can even actually do three volts, just two AA batteries. Mm -hmm. Four volts we like best because we're we can almost always get the motor spinning and and the, the buzzers buzzing and lots of lights going with it. Um, we have seen a lot of groups that do nine volts, and again the key there is just don't put your your LED directly to the the, the battery. You'll, you'll burn it out. Um, we've never really worked above the six volts. Um, there are people out there who have. We just really didn't have an interest in doing it. Um, I did get an email asking if you can use these for high voltage applications. I really wouldn't. Um, they don't. And oh, the other question we get is, what happens when it dries out? Um, it doesn't work. So when it dries out, um, so it, this really is a wet medium. Um, so you couldn't even make something and have it dry overnight. It would probably actually not work as soon as the moisture is all gone. Yeah, you know, another another reason. To, go for it. Overnight, it will, would work. So I just as a little experiment for myself, I rolled a big uh, just a cylinder, and what happened was it got hard on the outside, but the inside continued to stay pretty moist because uh, it kind of had that skin on it then, uh, protected. Um, it actually was kind of moist for about a month. Really? Wow. <laughs> the other challenge is if it's not so big a thing and you plug it in. Um, the as the play-doh dries, the hole for where it's in tends to expand, so then you just don't have the contact. Um, so we, we've typically seen it as a play with it, squish it up, and be done with it activity, but I, I, that's even me. I guess we can, it can last for a month. Oh. Semi-temporary, semi yeah. OK, and so you're mentioning it's easy to get kids interested, Emery, but how do you get teachers involved? How do you get teachers involved? Yeah. Um, you know, teachers are my heroes. Many of them are eager to do things in their classes. With the Squishy Circuit Project, we just posted everything. Um, in fact, we don't even really know where it's used um, unless people email us and tell us. We have a pretty active couple hundred person Facebook group. Um, and we've seen, you know, there was actually a school out on the West Coast where the home ec class combined with the computer science class. Um, they didn't call home economics. It was the family and consumer science class. It was home ec when I was in school. And they actually had the students who were learning cooking and measuring. They, did the, they made the batches of dough, and they combined with the class that was about to do Arduinos, and they worked on it. Um, we have had, in Australia, there's quite a few teachers who have used it there. Today, we heard of a research group in the UK that was using it. Um, so really, we've had people have found it there themselves. Um, but you know, in, in one thing we've definitely seen with the maker movement is so many people want to get young makers involved and kids involved. And it really doesn't take much convincing. There are amazing teachers out there. The trick is getting them the resources they need. Um, so that's many people who have interacted with this project have heard from Matt. Matt's an amazingly fast email respondent. Um, but I think the key is really getting that stuff out there for people to see and share, um, which is why I love all those sites that we just mentioned where people are sharing projects. Awesome. Well, Brian and Josie or Yuli, do you have any more questions for, uh, for Amory or for Matt or for Jonah about his project in that case? Yeah. No, really, there aren't any questions from the campers right now. So. I wonder, Jonah, Jonah cool. where can we learn more about your project? Is it on the Google Science Fair? Oh yes, if you, if you actually Google the Google Science Fair, then I'll probably be on their page right now. I haven't checked it for a while, but it, uh, it'll probably hold on. I can actually check it right now. What an incredible project. I look forward to, to, to learning more about it. What, and you don't know what grade are you in? Um, I'm going into ninth grade right now. Awesome. Oh uh, yeah, if you, if you Google the Google Science Fair page, then I'll be on there. So. That's amazing. Very cool. So Google, Google the Google Science Fair, and you'll find Jonah's project. Cool. So Anne-Marie and Matt, are there any cool projects you have uh, currently working on, or anything kind of in the, in the works that we can look forward to seeing in the future? Hmm? What are you working on? I, I work full-time at, at, at an internship now. And it's not that exciting, but I, uh, I have 16, no, 14 different heaters. They're about this big, half inch by half inch, and they go from 25C to 95C in about four seconds. Wow. And I have to cycle them for a week. And so I'm designing a uh, setup for that. And uh, cool. I'm learning LabVIEW. <laughs> That's cool. So is, are you testing the hardware, or is this an experiment? Or what's, the, what's the driving force behind this? Um, basically, they're just different adhesives holding the heaters on, and they're different heater uh, types. And just, we want to do long-term testing to see how they hold up with a lot of cycles. And so we'll see. And will that be like a, a research project you post, or? Uh... No, nope, this is for a uh, this is for a customer, and they want to prove that I, we have good products because yeah, I, like I said, it's for a company now, probably. So. 
That's, that's my cool. big thing right now. It's not that exciting, but it pays rent. <laughs> no, yeah. It's pretty cool. That has sent me these glowing emails about how much fun he's having at work. Yeah, and plus, plus, he's, plus he's working on his, his company, so he's, right. it's been fun to watch him go through that learning supply chain management and how do you, how do you get things out there. And I guess, Matt, before we go, uh, any uh, like recommendations for, or uh, tips for starting your own company? Oh, for starting Kind of like a little maker startup? Um, really, talk to everybody you can think of. I mean, Anne-Marie was obviously a big help with this project. Um, the open source hardware community was and, and, phenomenal. Right, absolutely phenomenal. Uh, the group of people uh, that I could name up right now that helped yeah. me and from that community is just great. And so put feelers out to them. And then anybody you can think of, my, my aunt is a lawyer. And so she's like, you know what? I have a lawyer friend who does nothing but business or you know, startup businesses. I'll put you in touch with them. And just put feelers out to all kinds of people. And don't be afraid to make mistakes. I've made a couple. And uh, whatever. Usually it's just money. <laughs> you can work more to get more of that at some time. So. I would say the key, the key thing, you know, particularly if you're working with kid projects, make sure that you've run it by a bunch of people for safety advice right. and and pilot tests. We were we were out, you know, within weeks of the first recipe, we were out even before we had the insulating dough. We were out with the solid dough and saran wrap as our insulator. You know, working with middle schoolers and really getting feedback on it. Right. Just get your projects out of your basement and, and start sharing them for advice. Very cool. Yeah, and and if you believe in your project and you believe it's a good thing and it's promoting learning or something good. It'll show and it'll be successful. Just be passionate about it and make sure you kind yeah. of invest in it. Yeah, yeah. that's where I was going for that. Cool. Well, uh, Jonah, do you have your uh, your Google Science Fair project planned out for uh, for next year already? Um, I actually don't know if I'm allowed to go in again. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's a good point. I guess we should look in that and see if you can actually compete. <laughs> but if you don't, would you have a second project that you could kind of? What was that? I was going to say, did you have advice for other, other people who would be entering something like that? Um, well, I guess when you see the, um, the first page, even the first submission page, you shouldn't get freaked out by the amount of writing it is because once you get into it, it's not as intimidating as it's Awesome. And then uh, would you have any recommendations for, uh, for some cool ideas or maybe um, some future projects you could collaborate on with somebody else? Um, I really haven't thought much about that. Yet. I'm, I'm still the the science fair was about three weeks ago, so I'm still trying to. Oh, so you're still kind of in the shell shock of uh, being a winner. Well, that's awesome! Congratulations <laughs> so much. Um, and yeah, if you haven't already, we'd love to see more pictures um, on Google Plus, and we'll definitely check out. Uh, we'll Google the Google Science Fair and uh, see more of your photos. Uh, so thanks everybody at Make Labs, uh, Josie and Yuli and Brian for hanging out with us today. And a uh, huge special thanks to Anne-Marie and Matt for joining us from the mill and giving us a tour and talking about squishy circuits. Uh, we'll be having a junior council hangout in about a half an hour from now. So if you'd like to join us, talk about squishy circuits and uh, other projects, go ahead and uh, leave us a comment under this post. And we'll add you to our circles and send the invite out in about 30 minutes. Um, and as always, uh, come back tomorrow. We'll be talking to uh, Lady Ada from uh, Adafruit. Uh, company that um, Emery was mentioning uh, about circuits and computer science and uh, more about electronics. Uh, so as always, campers, thanks for joining, and we will see you tomorrow. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.